opens a transparent trading room for cutting EU red tape. Europe needs reform. Hello everybody and welcome to my March Strasbourg video blog. And before I start, I'd like to say thank you very much to all of you who've been sending me such wonderfully supportive messages. I'm very glad that you all enjoy the video blog. Um, it, it's certainly a pleasure to do. So we're standing here now, you can see the sun shining in Strasbourg. I understand it is in the UK too, so let's think we've got some spring coming. So this plenary session, there's been a couple of important foreign affairs discussions, not least around uh, the ongoing issues in the Ukraine and the future of the European External Action Service. A very large report on that going through from one of our German colleagues who is effectively recommending that Europe takes over the defence budgets of member states. This is clearly something that I will not support and I, I really don't think it will get any support. Uh, enough support in the Parliament to get through. But it gives you a little bit of a flavour of the mindset and I suppose in some ways, um, I can understand why people are beginning to think that way a little bit more. When you look at the problems on the eastern borders, it's very easy for us in the UK not to think so much about that. But when you, if you're living in Poland or the Czech Republic or Romania, you have the problems in the Ukraine are in the next country. They're not a thousand miles away. They're not the other side of a continent. They are actually on your border. So. It's, it's really fascinating to talk uh, to people about how that feels, but I think we have to make sure that that doesn't create a demand which is fulfilled for more Europe in terms of defence. More cooperation, yes. More coherent policy, yes. I fully agree with that. But as I say, I'm determined that it won't mean that uh, we'll be getting more integration and harmonisation of our defence forces. And of course, all of that in the context of the discussion with NATO in terms of the 2% um, of budget allocation towards defence. So, uh, what else have we been doing? Well, we've had a very interesting report on women's equality, and I'm the Conservative spokesman for women and uh, gender equality, and I'm very, very determined that women should uh, maintain and, and indeed increase their importance in the world and our positions in, in government, in business, and in society. But, but, and it's a very big but, if we had to vote against the European Equality Report because it was asking for all kinds of things which we think are not anything to do with Europe centrally but are about member state competence. One of these most obvious of those was the desire for a European wide maternity leave legislation which we implacably oppose not because we don't think women need and should benefit from maternity leave, but simply because we don't think the one-size-fits-all culturally across Europe is at all appropriate. And we have a perfectly good system here in the UK. If people want to change it, then we'll change it via our own parliament. It's not necessary to do that via Europe. Uh, secondly, uh, it was asking for issues like gender equality to be brought into public procurement contracts. Again, that would be very difficult to do and it's a very specific and very prescribed way of dealing with gender equality which frankly we Conservatives simply don't agree with. So we feel that there's a missed opportunity actually for gender equality here in Europe and that we should concentrate on the basic building blocks, the basic principles of free and fair societies with individuals having responsibility and also having advantages from being citizens of countries that recognise their equality, both gender, race, religion and everything else. And that adding on all of these extraneous issues, like insisting on certain qualification or sort of allocation of women on boards of companies, etc., is not helpful. In fact, it leads to resistance, and I certainly don't think that that's the right way forward. And just a final note, uh, very locally, um, as you all will know, we have a very strong bass uh, fishery in the southwest. We have a commercial fishery, but we all also have huge recreational bass fishery. And a lot of the people who run those businesses used to be commercial fishermen. I know this from experience. And so uh, we're very keen to make sure that the bass fishery for recreational um, fish is, is, remains open. 
Uh, but we have to recognise that all the scientific advice is that uh, bass are at a critical point and that if we don't take some action to reduce the catch uh, for the short to medium term, then we will simply not uh, have stocks available at anything like uh, the maximum sustainable yield. So in this Parliament, we haven't voted on it yet, but we will be later today, we'll be voting on measures to um, to reduce the, the fishing effort in bass and we will be voting to make sure that, that uh, we allow those stocks to recover over the next couple of years so that we can have a strong and thriving fishery in the future. So thank you very much for listening. I look forward to seeing you all again next month in April.